I wanted to just talk a little bit about preemptive prosecution. I think my role here is to give you the big picture. Um, preemptive prosecution is a, is a notion by the federal government that you can tell a person the security uh, dangers of a person by their ideology. If you know the ideology, it will somehow predict whether or not they will commit crimes. And so if you follow that out, all you have to do is arrest people whose ideology you're concerned about, and then you won't have any crimes, and you will have to convict them of some trumped up charge. It is the Cheney 1% doctrine. You remember this? If there's 1% chance that the person might raise a security concern, you have to treat it as though it's 100% certainty. If a man comes into a bar and looks at you in a menacing way, you have to pull out your gun and shoot him dead. Right? That's the Cheney theory. That's the preemptive prosecution. And so all of these people here, this is essentially what the government has done. They have said, for some reason, we, we have concerns about these people. We're not going to have to tell you why. But we're going to come up with fake, contrived charges in order to get you locked up. And that's what all these cases are. They're all 100% fake cases. Um, and I have to say that the derivation for this, it seems like a modern phenomenon after 9-11. But in fact, this is just COINTELPRO reinvented. Yeah, that's right. And Brother uh, Ab Abumi here gave, you a uh, yes, gave us a long history that even goes back before COINTELPRO. But COINTELPRO targeted the African American community. And for, for years, they have borne the brunt of this, of these fake charges, this harassment, this constant uh, lying and manipulating to keep a a uh, community down because of the fear of the security concerns that it, it brings to the white, white community, the power structure. So in any event, uh, I, I just want to point out that at, in, during Cohen Toll Pro, they went after the, uh, the peace activists also. They went after the leftists. They went after the socialists. Once that was exposed, people were horrified at what had happened. They saw how far we had tilted toward a fascist regime. And then, uh, now after 9-11, all of that has come back again. There are two ways that the federal government goes about doing preemptive prosecutions. One is with the material support for terrorism statute. The material, you have to think of it this way, you know, there are uh, conflicts all over the world. And our government has the luxury of deciding who our allies are and saying that the other people are the terrorists. This doesn't mean that the, both sides don't use violence indiscriminately equally on both sides. It just simply means that for political reasons we like one side and for political reasons we're going to call the other people terrorists. But what they have done by doing that is to criminalize any contact with this group that for political reasons they say we shouldn't be contacting. Uh, and for example, if you go and try to do, have contact with a group to uh, really reduce the violence, lower the level of violence, so that there won't be any violence in these communities. That would be material support for terrorism. If I, as a lawyer, file a brief on behalf of a designated foreign terrorist organization to try to convince the courts that they were wrongly designated, that would be material support for terrorism. I could be thrown in jail. If somebody takes a position, as Samuel Alarian did, saying the Palestinians have rights, they actually have rights. We should be able to talk about our rights. And if what he says was similar to what some designated terrorist organization in Palestine is saying, that would be material support for terrorism also, according to the government. If you went and built schools and hospitals in Palestine to relieve the suffering of the people there, the government says that would enhance the prestige of Hamas, the, the ruling party over there. That is material support for terrorism. And this Hassan Alashi up here is spending 65 years in jail because of that. This is a compassionate man, a wonderful man. And his family and, and the family of all of the defendants in the Holy Land case just dedicated their lives to relieving suffering all around the world. And instead of thanks, they get 65 years in jail? This is insane. So. Another way they do it is by the agent provocateur. You've heard about this. Um, I just have one case because it bothers me so, so much. This was the case of Tariq Shaw, and you saw his picture up there. He had the, the bass. Tariq Shaw, I don't know, how many, how many do you know him as a, as a musician? 
he's actually he's he's quite famous. Uh, if you go on on uh, on the, online, there's a nice biography about him about his influence on jazz music and so on. He actually played at Clinton's inaugural. He was running a martial arts school, and he had one other problem. His father was the bodyguard for Malcolm X. And anybody who came out of the Nation of Islam who had that kind of background, the FBI, I think, never forgets. No. And so, for some reason, they decided they wanted to get him. We don't know why. But they assigned an agent provocateur to try to get him. And the agent tried and tried, tried to defend him, tried to get him to talk him into something, couldn't do it, finally got completely frustrated, walked off. So they assigned another person to get him. This guy went to Tariq and said, brother, can you teach me how to play the bass? He said, sure I can. He said, brother, I don't have a place to live. Can I move in with you? You can move in with me. So he moved into his house and talked about uh, various things for a matter of months, tape recording everything secretly. And he kept saying, uh, you know, I have some brothers that would like to learn how to do martial arts. You know, they kind of like to do Al-Qaeda kind of stuff. You know, would you train them? And finally, Tariq says something about, look, I'll train anybody. I don't care if they're with Al-Qaeda. And that's basically what they got him for. Nothing happened, but that's why he was convicted of saying, sure, you know, I will train anybody. I don't care if they're with Al-Qaeda. Now, he's spending, what is it, 17 years in jail, I think. But what it bothers me to think that the federal government can go in there and spend year after year walking around with you, trying to befriend you, trying to you know, be your best friend while secretly tape recording all your conversations. Can you imagine what that must be like? Is that the country you want to live in? No. Now, the other one of the, uh, the uh, National Coalition for the Protection of Civil Freedoms has three campaigns. We are doing profiling, prisoner abuse, and preemptive prosecution. And I want to just talk for a minute about prisoner abuse, because I think this is a really serious issue. One of the things that the government has done since 9-11 is to arrogate to itself, if I can use that word, the right upon accusing somebody of terrorist-related crimes, to take them and put them in solitary confinement pre-trial. You can be put their pretrial without any judicial oversight whatsoever. You can be put there under conditions that are so strict that even if you're allowed to talk to your lawyer, your lawyer cannot talk to anybody else about what you've conversed about. And this is a, a uh, it's called SAMS, Special Administrative Measures, and you can be kept there for years in solitary confinement. Now we know under the Geneva Convention that you're not allowed to keep somebody in solitary confinement for more than 30 days because you start to deteriorate mentally after that. So to be kept in solitary confinement for years generates almost automatically mental deterioration. You be, and, and if you dis, hear people describe it, the Tariq Shah was in, in uh, solitary confinement and he describes how your ideas become confused, how you, it's difficult for you even to speak, how you become paranoid, how you experience terrors in the night because you may never go out. It's like being suffocated. It's like being buried alive. It is torture. It is, it is absolute torture. And we have cases, and I think perhaps one of the worst cases that I've heard of was Mohammed Wasarni, who was one of these classic cases. He was in the Middle East. He came back. The government asked if they could talk to him. They, he told them all about this. This is all pre-9-11. And then after they talked to him, they said, great, you'll have to become an informant for us. And he said, I'm not going to become an informant. And they said, fine, then we'll charge you with lying to us. And they did. Even though later they acknowledged that he'd been absolutely correct. They put him into solitary confinement in Sam's, kept him there for five and a half years. And finally, he could not stand the torture anymore. And he, he was so mentally deranged, he could not uh, defend himself in court. And he had no alternative but to plead guilty. And when he pled guilty, they released him. They, up until that moment, he was the most dangerous man in America. He was so dangerous that they could not allow him even to speak to another human being for five and a half years. And the moment he pled guilty, he was released. Sorry, I, I don't mean to uh, <laughs> overdo it. So that is, uh, that is the problem with Sands. And I have to say one other case here which really troubles me. There is a great lawyer that we have all loved named Lynn Stewart. 
And Lynn Stewart, of course, is the, is the poster child. Right. Let's hear it for Lynn Stewart, all right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna send her a letter and told you she, you got a round of applause when I mentioned her name. And of course, she was the one who went in there and said, look, this is nonsense. I can't represent my client if I'm not allowed to talk with anybody afterwards about what he said. So she went out and held a press conference. And nobody at that time cared. The government didn't care, nobody else cared. Why? Because it was before 9-11. And then after 9-11, they went back and they said, oh, we're going to have to shut up the lawyers. And they went after her, they charged her with material support for terrorism, and she's now spending 10 years in jail for that. Um, so anyway, I, I'm, I'm running out of time quickly here. I wanted to just go on and mention CNUs. This is what they do after they convict you. They put you in an isolation prison, special prison out there. Mostly Muslims, but they're also including a few environmentalists, other dangerous people, uh, probably the peace activists may end up there, uh, animal rights people, very dangerous. Um, and I wanted to just quickly, if I have a, a moment here to... Oh, I, I think you're going to have to do this. I can't, I can't... All right. Um, I wanted to just sort of end here with a few thoughts about what the National Coalition would like to do. One of the things that happened was that the uh, Congress uh, was concerned about all the massive surveillance programs that were going on about their legality, and so they asked for a study by the Inspector Generals of the Five Clandestine Services and the uh, Department of Justice. And the report, there's a July 10th, 2009 report, noted that there was no mechanism provided for by the government to turn over exculpatory information discovered by the clandestine services in their bugging and so on. Now, of course, whenever they have one of these fake preemptive prosecution cases, they always bug everybody. So our, our feeling is that there's a mass of exculpatory information which they've never turned over, and the Justice Department has acknowledged that. They've said, this is wrong, and we recommend that all of these people should have an opportunity to go back, the Justice Department should review all of these cases to see if they fail to turn over exculpatory evidence as required by law. And we believe if they were to do that, most of these people would go free because these were fake cases to begin with. Of course, the Justice Department has ignored that recommendation. And, uh, stop? All right, uh, I'll click it. Uh, and so we're trying to uh, have a bill which will require that they, they comply with the Inspector General's recommendation. The second thing is, we would like to put SAMs under judicial control. Why should locking people up pretrial in solitary confinement be different than a bail decision? That's right. We want the CMUs closed once and for all. These are illegal prisons. They have no business being here. Finally, I'd like to see a commission that would investigate all of the COINTELPRO era there are still many people sitting in jail that were illegally framed, and we've got to get them out. That's right. And I'm going to, I just want to quickly uh, end up by saying, I see a little hope in the future. Just this week, two articles came out in mainstream media. One article had to do with the CMU. The other had to do with the, uh, the preemptive prosecution. Uh, the preemptive prosecution was by Petra Bartosiewicz, who has been a terrific reporter, and it has to do with, it's in Harper's, Harper's Magazine, and I think it's going to be in the stands either today or on Monday. Uh, the other one is in the New York Magazine, not New Yorker, but New York Magazine by Chris Stewart and on the CMUs. And what is exciting about both of these is that here are two really good reporters who told the truth. I couldn't have written either of those better. And it was published in a mainstream magazine. And I think this may break the taboo that I've seen in the mainstream magazines against anything that comes close to the truth. I'm hoping now, if this gets picked up, we may have turned a corner, suddenly the media may have to say, you know, there's a lot of cases out there, we should take a look at them. You know, Petra's looked at them, why can't we? So I think this may be the beginning of something really, uh, really great. I'm sorry, I've way overstayed my time. Thank you very much.